In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O dear faithful in Christ, and especially uh, dear sisters, Uh, today is the, as I mentioned, the feast of the transverberation of Teresa of Avila, uh, the founder of the Reformed Order of the Discalced Carmelites. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit about her experience there, as well as uh, the law of St. Joseph Calasanz, uh, whose feast day, as I mentioned, is today in the Universal Church. So Teresa of Avila, as we know, one of the greatest mystics of the Church, uh, author of the work The, uh, the Interior Castle, Um, of uh, describing the, the various mansions of the soul as a means of describing the soul's closeness to God. The closer a soul is united to God on this earth, according to uh, Teresa of Avila's writings, uh, the more um, you, in, you, you uh, progress in the interior castle, right? the interior mansion. And when you get to the very heart of that mansion, uh, there you find Christ seated uh, on a throne uh, of the heart. Right? That's, that's where Uh, we could say the pinnacle of, of union. Uh, she calls it also the mystical marriage, right? The seventh mansion. So uh, this event of hers, the transverberation, which occurred in the year around 1582, uh, is, is held as being her entrance into this seventh mansion, uh, the pinnacle of union with Christ on this earth, the mystical marriage. Uh, it, it did occur when she was in prayer, and uh, as, as she describes, she, she visibly saw an angel next to her, which she said, um, this was very unusual for me to see an angel physically. Usually it's a, it's a, a different kind of vision. So she was seeing angels all the time, but this was a, a different kind of vision. Uh, and this, this angel, she said, was, was uh, smaller, and he had a, a, a face that seemed to be just burning, glowing. Uh, she said she supposed him to be one of, one of the, uh, the seraphim, which means the burning ones in Hebrew. And he had a, a spear with which he stabbed her repeatedly, as she said, in the heart and in the entrails, and it left her insides uh, burning. She said it, it, was, it was a very painful experience, but the pain, it was primarily a spiritual pain, although she said the body did participate somewhat in that pain, but it was entirely eclipsed by the spiritual sweetness that accompanied it. And, and whatever, the, whatever the level of pain may have been, uh, the, the sweetness uh, by far was, 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 uh, was worth it. She said, if, if I had to feel this pain always, I absolutely would in order to feel the sweetness. She says also, if, if anybody disbelieves me, I hope this happens to them so they can, they can see. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Uh, but it was, it was, so she said she was beside herself for, for days after this experience. Just she didn't want to think or see or talk to anybody else. She just wanted to, 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 to be there and, and enjoy our Lord's presence and be with him. It just was continuous. Um, and she said this continued for some time as she would go into these, um, she would call them a trance, where she would just feel that, that burning love increase inside of her. She couldn't do anything except uh, she would like fall almost senseless. And m most, um, would say humiliating for her was that this would occur in the presence of other people. She'd be talking with them, speaking, and then she would go into these ecstasies. And so it became public knowledge that what was happening, which was, which was um, rather uh, difficult for her to experience. It's, it's, and, and the saints are like this. Anybody really, uh, you know, if you've ever experienced a, a really um, kind of intimate, personal experience at prayer, it's, it's, it's private. You don't want other people knowing about that. It's, it's, it's a personal matter. And so the saints, when they have these, these ecstasies or these experiences with God, it's a personal thing. They don't want that to be public knowledge. And so it is. It's a humiliation when, when other people are, are seeing that and seeing the effects of it. Uh, so that is, um, but it's, it's for their edification, right? And that's why God permits it. And that's why um, we are only going to advance as far as our humility allows us um, in, in that God... Um, Uh, you know, he wants that. We have to be willing to do whatever he wants, right? And it's the humble person says, okay, you, you can do whatever you want um, in, in the manner, in the manner, to the extent, whatever it may be. Uh, so that was that was St. Teresa of Avila's. That was her transverberation, her entrance into that seventh mansion, that mystical marriage with Christ. And uh, when, they, when, they, when she died, right, and her body was found incorrupt several years later, and they did an autopsy, and they had her heart, and it was pierced. There was an actual physical piercing in her heart, which, which uh, corroborated the story that she had uh, spoken of earlier. So once again, people always talk about, you know, scientific proof for religion or for God. Well, here we go, over and over again. Can they explain uh, incorruptible bodies? Eh, they try. They, yeah, they got something, but not really. Can you explain this? Uh, Teresa of Avila's heart had a piercing in it? Uh, well, not really. I mean, yeah, you can. You can explain it away, but... 
go through all the time. Like Teresa, um, Philip Neri had an experience. His heart was, was, was inflamed with the love of God. When they autopsied him, his heart was grossly enlarged. It was huge. Uh, so all of these things, there, there's, there's not just the proof of what the saints themselves wrote, but there's scientific proof afterwards also. Uh, so the, the, the lesson for us from St. Teresa would be uh, strive for that union with, with Christ, right? Strive for that mystical marriage. That's, that is why God came on earth, to espouse himself to his creatures. That's why the church is called the bride of Christ. We are the, the mystical body. We are the bride, and Christ is the bridegroom. Uh, so a, a great lesson from Teresa of Avila there today. And then briefly, if I might mention St. Joseph Calasant, um, uh, and you would say, what, what, what does a bride want? What does a bride and a bridegroom, what does Christ want for his church? He wants his children to be taken care of, right? And, and, and that is the children on, on this earth, and that is what St. Joseph Calasant did. Um, and he would have been uh, a contemporary of Teresa of Avila's. He was born in 1557, uh, died in 1648. He was um, almost 90 years old. Um, he was born in Spain, and he ended up, um, he was a, a ordained a priest uh, later in, in years because his father was against it at first, but eventually he was ordained a priest, spent 10 years working in the diocese in Spain, and then ended, uh, ended up going to Rome, and there founded uh, a schools for orphans, for children. And so this would have been around this, close to 1590, and Rome was still in shambles because, if you remember, the sack of Rome in 1527, those mercenary Protestant soldiers of Charles V had, had, weren't getting paid, and they sacked Rome, uh, just totally uh, uh, ruined it, destroyed it, kind of the end of the, um, what would you call that, the Renaissance in Rome. Uh, so they, they um, sacked Rome, and the social order broke down, uh, the plague uh, swept through Rome, there was all kinds of, of um, uh, breakdown of the social order, and so these orphans, that was the result. So Joseph Calasans goes there, uh, establishes these schools, uh, is teaching the orphans, taking care of them. And he originally opens, you know, one school, starts small, and then a few others. And then after 10 years, he's taking care of a thousand orphans. And uh, he ends up actually establishing the public school system in Europe. Uh, he was the founder of it. Um, since the medieval monasteries, there hadn't really been an educational system quite like it. And especially uh, in the manner that he taught, in that um, by now, there was kind of a caste system established in Europe where there was the poor and the um, underprivileged, and that was their lot in life. That's just what you did. And when he began educating them the, who couldn't afford uh, a school or who were supposed those kinds of people shouldn't be getting an education anyways. They're common laborers. They're of the lower class. They don't need an education. And in fact, it's going to do more harm than good because if they get educated, uh, they'll get uppity. They'll think that their work is beneath them. They're, they're smarter than this. They're better than this. And they deserve better. And then who's going to be our common laborers? Who's going to do that menial work? So this is the opposition to uh, St. Joseph Calasans and the order that he founded. Um, and, and those would follow him. Um, St. John Baptiste de Salle would follow his example 100 years later. And St. John Bosco, about 200 years later, would carry on his tradition of this uh, uh, schools, public schooling and education for uh, the poorest of the poor. Uh, but if, if we could, uh, let's see, if we could be, let's, let's be progressive. Let's, let's be woke these days, right? So um, uh, St. Joseph Calasans was anti-racist and anti-classist uh, because he didn't want this, this, no, regardless of what your class is, you should be able to get an education and my schools will provide it for you. Uh, he was um, tolerant of other religions. Right? He would accept Protestant students, Muslim students, Jewish students. It didn't matter what religion somebody was, his schools would accept them. And he would teach them to pray, by the way. Um, and, uh, but he was very, very tolerant of other religions, we could say. The, the Muslims, in fact, the Ottoman Turks, asked if he would come into their own country and start founding schools and teaching their students. Okay, that's how effective his order became. And he would have done it, but he didn't have the manpower. He didn't have the teachers. Um, he also uh, took in special needs students before they even knew what that was. The handicapped, the mentally ill, uh, whatever it was, he would take them in and teach them as best they could. And you can imagine the patience this would require from the teachers because they didn't even know what these things were. They didn't have names for the various uh, uh, disorders and disabilities that, that people may have, but the teachers were willing to work with the students anyways as much as, as they could. Uh, he established the first STEM school, science, technology, 
they didn't have engineering or whatever, but science and math, he was very uh, um, uh, insistent that this should be taught. And he was friends with Galileo, which caused him some trouble. Uh, but he liked Galileo's theory of heliocentrism, and he would send his teachers to learn from, from Galileo. And this, again, got him into trouble. You're teaching the poor, you're making the, the, the lower classes uppity, you're hanging out with Galileo, who's a heretic, which he wasn't, by the way. That's not what Galileo was accused of. Uh, he was accused of heresy, and the Inquisition cleared him of it. They said, no, this is not heresy. This is an um, academic um, issue. T t take care of it somewhere else. This is not an issue of faith. Galileo died a, a good Catholic. He had the sacraments. Uh, but but um, Joseph Calasanz's association with him was a... Um, source, another source of controversy. Another relevant aspect of Joseph Calasanz's life was that he suffered from abusive clergy. Uh, there was a teacher of his who was abusing the boys, but because this teacher was from a noble family, nothing could be done about it. I couldn't be touched. The noble family wouldn't allow this teacher to be disciplined. And so St. Joseph couldn't do anything, uh, but, but young boys are being abused. <coughs> uh, so he promotes him out of a teaching position into a higher administrative order just to get him away from the boys. And so this was seen as St. Joseph uh, Calasanz um, favoring the abuser, but it was, it was more just practically, this is the only thing I can do to, to keep the boys safe. And it backfired on him uh, despite his best intentions because after that promotion, that abuser was made superior general of the very order Joseph Calasanz started. <clears throat> See, this is how corruption works, right? People want to blame the church or the institution. It's, it's those evil, corrupt, disgusting, sickening, twisted individuals in the orders who have uh, their lust for power, their lust for pleasure, uh, knows no bounds, and they stop at nothing to get and control power. And then they, 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 they pull others of their sick, disgusting, twisted individuals into it and protect them. This is how it works. And then people blame the whole order. Uh, so it's, 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 that's, that's almost always the case when you look at this, this kinds of things. There's corruption at the top that prevents it from being addressed. And so what happened to St. Joseph? Um, he was, uh, his order was suppressed and he got kicked out of it. He was, he was disciplined. He was removed and, and punished for being incompetent or whatever it may be. And he died. He died when his order was still suppressed. All of his work, all the good work he saw for these orphans being done, uh, he died. And it looked like to him his order was going to be um, uh, scattered. Uh, that was not the case, however. Uh, it was reinstituted eight years after his death, and his, his name was cleared, and he was exonerated of all wrongdoing. And as, it, as we I mentioned a few days ago for um, um, King Louis IX, right, virtue is not, we don't always see the effects of our virtue in this life. Sometimes we have to wait until the afterlife to see what, what we've accomplished. Uh, so that was the case for St. Joseph uh, Calassance. Uh, but as I mentioned, he, he died when he was um, nearly around 90 years old, and uh, it was, it was, he worked all the way to the end. He didn't um, uh, retire or say, well, I've, I've done as, as much work as I, I should. Uh, I can retire now. I'm, it's over. All the way to the very end, uh, he, he was working. And I would say today, you know, that is so important in, that in, the, in, in the world today. We have so many orphans. Uh, n not physically, but, but spiritually, but emotionally, but psychologically. The world is full of orphans. Children are being brought up, and they have no adults they can look to for an example. They're being told that women can be men, and men can be women, and you have to accept this, and you should do that, and boys are punished for, for, being, for being male, and, and, and women are told to be promiscuous from the youngest of ages. Nobody knows which end is up anymore. It's like the whole world is being run by insane children. Uh, and, 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 and these children growing up, are, they need adults, they need parents, and they don't have them. Uh, and, and that is a huge, huge problem. And, and it's, it's one, it's in the educational system. It, it is, it, um, uh, people want to focus on the presidency and who's going to get elected. Look, you can win the election for the next 50 years. If you don't do something about the schools, nothing will change. Uh, that is where our fight needs to be. And I, I would say we need to be um, getting involved in that. What is being taught in our schools, public schools as well as private? People have this idea, I'm going to homeschool my kids and, and my kids will be okay. Well, what about all those other kids out there? Right? It's not your kids burning down buildings right, and shouting, kill the cops, but it's somebody else's kid who went to public school and, and they got corrupted. And, and so we, can't, we can no longer afford to back away from that fight. We have to be out there. What are the teachers' unions doing? What are the, what's the curriculum in the classroom? And it's as, it's sometimes it's as bad in the Catholic schools as anywhere else. It's not a problem we can ignore. 
Uh, so I would encourage everybody, you know, pray for the intercession of, of, of St. Joseph Calasans to know what should we do uh, for our children's education, our children, the world's children. What are the textbooks? What are they being taught? Who's got oversight of that? We need to be involved. Uh, so find a teacher and thank them and then ask, what can I do? Uh, so we can ask. Let's just ask for the uh, intercession of Joseph Calasans and Teresa of Avila, uh, that we might be faithful to our spouse, right, Christ and the church, and take care of our children in the world and lead them to Christ, whether they're, as Joseph Calasans did, Jew or Muslim or Protestant or whatever, take them in, educate them, teach them the truth, and then they will come to love God. We teach them their prayers, teach them to love God. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.